This is squash. This is four walls, two rackets, one ball. This is a lightning bolt of energy, a nuclear pinball, a cage you have willingly locked yourself into. This is an improvised duet on the hardest of stages. This is not for the faint hearted. This is squash. This is an amphitheater. Coliseum where two gladiators will battle to the end. A boxing ring with no neutral corners. These rackets are swords. They are rifles. They are the Grim Reaper's side. This is a territory to be claimed and reclaimed. This is squash. This is a fruit which most people think is a vegetable. Not that squash. This is squash. This is poetry in motion. A cubist masterpiece painted in a frenzy of creativity. This is rubber ball jazz, just a coverage in a bad mood. This is Ozzy Osbourne biting the head off a bat. This is squash. This is a non-alcoholic beverage that comes in a variety of flavors. Orange, apple, mango, apple and mango. Not that squash. This is squash. This is the best of five, a point on every rally. This is knowing when to cross some lines and knowing when to stay within others. This is controlling the tea. This is serves and volleys, drops and lobs, nicks and boasts. This is lets and strokes. This is love all, one, one love. love. This is turning it up to 11. This is underrated. Overexerted. Instantaneous. Temporaneous. Spontaneous. Swash. My name is Jahangir Khan. It means conqueror of the world. My name is James Wilstrop. It means, actually, I don't know what it means, but some people call me the marksman. <coughs> My name is Maria Tortakai Wazir, but you can call me Genghis Khan. I am from Karachi, the biggest city in Pakistan. I am from Yorkshire, the biggest county in... Actually, no, I was born in Norfolk, but I'm not really from there. Where are you from? That can be quite difficult, can't it? Mm. <clears throat> I am from Toronto in Canada, but I was born in Waziristan on the borders of Pakistan and Afghanistan. Oh, I was world number one. Ten times British Open champion, six times world champion, 61 major titles. Oh, and I hold the record for the longest unbeaten run of any sportsman ever. Seriously, search it up. 555 games without losing. 555, five, five, baby. I've got four letters for you. G-O-A-T. Greatest of all time. <clears throat> yeah, I too was world number one. 46 major titles. And I am the current Commonwealth Games gold medal holder. Oh, actually I am. Really? Because he's just an actor. Sorry just an actor. That's a little bit rude, isn't it? But he's just pretend... He's pretending. Also, if you want some notes, just ask. I don't think he'd be giving it all that. I think he'd be quite humble about it, actually. Maybe even a bit shy. Yeah, I didn't ask. <laughs> I am <laughs> Pakistan's greatest ever female player. Pretending? Do you mind? Just saying. I was young player My biggest year. strength is my tenacity. No matter what you throw at me, I will still hold on. I was Young Player of the Year. I won the Nash Cup, the Liberty Bell. Of my the biggest South strength West. is my self-control. No matter how angry I feel inside, I can always keep calm and deliver the goods. I am a shadow, a whisper in the trees, a master of disguise. I am invisible. In the mountains of northwest Pakistan, grows a tree. Its crown is wide and open, its branches long and proud. It's a hardy tree, it won't be beaten by drought, 
It won't bend to the wind or freeze in the cold. The fruit it grows is full of nourishment. As a result, it travels widely and is highly prized, fetching good money wherever it goes. My family know this fruit as Chilgoza or Neja. You might know it simply as the pine nut. The scientific name for this tree is Pinus gerardiana. It is named after the British Army officer, Captain Patrick Gerard, who discovered it and brought it back to England in 1839. My own family tree has borne fruit as rich as the Chilgoza. The branches have supported generations of a success that is unparalleled. For me, it has nurtured an income as lucrative and a life as successful as your tasty middle-class nuts. Like this tree, we have come through immense hardship. Like this tree, our journey will forever be linked to those same British soldiers who occupied our land so long ago. Playing games, something we all do from a really early age. Games are how we socialize, how we learn to win, how we learn to lose. Jahangir, Jahangir, where has that boy got to now? But when I was a child, there were many games that were off limits to me. Children, have you seen my boy, Jahangir? That's me. I didn't really speak until I was eight, and I had a lot of muscle problems, uh, hernias. Oh, my little one, what have I told you about playing with the other children? <gasps> yeah! Jahan Khan, you stop this immediately. My parents had been told I shouldn't play physical games because it was too dangerous. I know it's hard. But be patient, your time will come. To tell you the truth, it was quite a track. Uh, you see, by the time I came along, there had already been quite a lot of champions in my family. Where are you going now? Ah, your father's racket. I know it's hard. But be patient, you will get your chance. You are a Khan. I know it's hard, my mother told me. But you will get your chance. You are a Khan. My family are Pathans. Over hundreds of years, so many different tribes tried to rule over us. They never succeeded. By the 19th century, it was the turn of the British to try. My great-great-grandfather, Rehmatullah Khan, the Imam of Nawakile, made a decision. Instead of fighting them, he would work with them. As the army built their forts and garrisons, my family made sure they found employment from the British. Little did they know they would soon be beating them at their own game. While the soldiers settled, they brought with them sports and games to give a taste of their faraway home. By the 1930s, Rehmatullah's son, Abdul Majid, had been working in the Peshawar Club for many years. Ah, Abdul Majid, have you seen Captain Meldrum? I'm supposed to be playing him at four. I'm afraid not, sir. Oh, damn it, blast it. That fellow would be late for his own funeral. Yes, sir. Oh, do be a gent, will you, and... Uh... Give this spot an extra going over. I gave old Stevens a bit of a pounding yesterday. Poor fellow ran straight into the side wall and cracked his head open. Bally fool. Yes, sir. Oh, blast this heat and the dust. You know, I don't know how you people can stand it. Did I ever tell you about back home? Many times. Oh, beautiful. Except for the rain. Except for the rain, of course. And the cold. And the cold. 
It's not all the time, you see. It's not all the time. <sighs> Where in damnation has that man got to? Oh, Abdul Majid, there's nothing else for it. You're pretty handy with the racket. I've seen you. Go and fetch one and give me a game. That's an order. But Major Harris said I Never need to... Never mind what Major Harris said. Go and get a racket. Yes, sir. Oh! Don't do that to me. Scram! Going away with you. Oh, you want to play, do you? Well, you can't. It's not your place, so there. You know, I'm beginning to lose my patience. Get away! And this really is the limit. Would you get back in your place? It's a thing about you, Patans. Know how to look a man in the eye. See to it that the court is cleaned up, Khan. And that's more or less how a generation of boys all picked up a racket and began to play. My uncles, Hashim, Azam, Nasrullah, and my dear father, Roshan Khan, all took up lucrative positions in clubs around what was still the British Raj, or India. But change was coming. Birmingham 2022, the Commonwealth Games, right here in this city. Athletes from all over the world will be playing on this very court. This is our big moment. So much attention, such a high. Walking on to the opening ceremony with 5,000 other athletes. Being stopped in the street for my autograph. This is my fifth and probably final Commonwealth Games, but I've had a good run at it. I got a silver in Melbourne, a silver in Delhi, I got a silver and a bronze in Glasgow, and then finally, I got a gold and a bronze at the last Commonwealth Games in Australia. It's the closest we ever get to the buzz of the Olympics. But don't even get me started on that. Hi, excuse me. Couldn't help noticing your badge and yeah. everything. Are you in the Commonwealth Games? Yeah, I am actually. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Could I be really cheeky and ask for a selfie? Sure, I'd be happy to. Do you mind just coming a little bit lower? lower yeah. yeah, just a little bit more. More. Perfect. So, uh, are you a high jumper? You look tall enough. They are tall, actually, aren't they? But, no. Runner, marathon, maybe. No, no, it's not athletics. I'm a swimmer. Bet you're a proper good swimmer. Squash. I play squash. Oh, never really heard of squash before. Kind of sounds like a uh, drink. Yeah, or like a vegetable or something. Oh, it's a fruit. Okay. Oh, it's actually played in 185 countries all across the world. It should oh. be in the Olympics, but... Oh, all right, like, well, uh, good luck with that. Yeah. Ta-ra. Um, bye. <sighs> so, how did squash find its way across the globe? And how did people start playing it in the first place? I mean, what came first? Was it a racket and a ball? Was it the chicken or the egg? Ant or deck? To seek out the roots of the game, you need to look here. A notorious little spot in the back streets of London, the turn of the 19th century. Ladies and gentlemen, I give to you the story of squash. In 1822, in the prison of Fleet, petty criminals and debtors were kept off the street. A spell inside the jailer in the slammer or the nick could be enough to do you nothing, could really make you sick. But the villains of this story didn't let that bring them down. The cure for their discomfort soon was known around the town. It's hard to see how anyone 
could love a prison wall, but all they had to do was get a racket and a ball. A racket and a ball. A racket and a ball. Five minute exercise, cheer up lads. Might never happen. Never does, sir. I'm not a lad, sir. We're bored, sir. Same thing every day, sir. Get up, clean yourself, an hour in the yard, lunch in the canteen, then back to bed. Boring, sir. Bored, sir. Well, you've got to make the most of it. Homesick, sir. Miss home, sir. Oh, I've got a letter, sir, from home. It just said, dear Harry, I bet you're bored. Ha, <laughs> love, Mum. She must be a clever one. Well, you need to innovate. What with, sir? I don't know. Use your imagination. Use the environment. There's nothing here, sir. All's we has got is brick walls. What a bunch of whiners. Bored, sir. Miss Alm, sir. Nothing to do, sir. What a racket. The nation's future leaders at Harrow Public School are not unlike a prisoner. They have to follow rules. When a new gang came to their backyard in 1831, these privileged young boys thought it was jolly spiffing fun. They thought about a new name to give this oddball sport. They called it Squash. It was the sound it made on court. It's hard to see how anyone could love a schoolyard wall, but all they had to do was get a racket and a ball. A racket and a ball. A racket and a ball. Five minute playtime. Cheer up, lads. Might never happen. Never does, sir. I'm not a lad, sir. <laughs> We're bored, sir. Same thing every day, sir. Get up, clean your room, lunch in the canteen, an hour of games and then back to bed. Boring, sir. Bored, sir. Make the most of it. And homesick, sir. Miss home, sir. Oh, I got a letter, sir, from home. It just said, dear Harry, I bet you're bored, but chin up and get on with it. Love, mother. That's what mine said. Well, you need to innovate. What do it, sir? I don't know. Use your imagination. There's nothing here, sir. Actually, we've got quite a bit here. All right, there's nothing new then. What a bunch of whiners. Bored, sir. He's home, sir. Nothing to do, sir. What a racket! From schoolboys on to soldiers, that's how the story goes. It's a narrative that won't end well, and all of history knows. When a land is taken over against the people's will, it's the type of situation that can only bring you ill. They settled in a region, they called it British Raj. Nations never prosper when an army's left in charge. It's hard to see how anyone could love a Barrett's wall, but all they had to do was get a racket and a ball. A racket and a ball. A racket and a ball. Fall out. Cheer up, lads. Might never happen. We're, We're bored, bored, sir. Make the most of it. Oh, I got a letter, sir, from home. It just said, dear Harry, I bet you're bored. And are you keeping your socks clean? Because if you are, you must be bored. Because you never did that at home. Love, Mum. Home, home six, six, sir. What a, a racket. And a, a racket and a ball. A racket and a ball. A racket and a ball. So, the soldiers played their games in the clubs of the British Raj. But empires crumble, and a seismic shift was about to rupture the country. In 1947, partition brought much bloodshed, but there were countless wounds that were inflicted under the surface, unseen, deep under the skin. My uncle Nasullah experienced this firsthand when he was working as a coach at the Delhi Tennis and Squash Rackets Club. Ah, Mr. Khan, Nasrullah, so good to see you. How long's it been? My uncle waited, as was custom, to be invited over the threshold. Please do come in. He waited as was expected to be invited to sit. Please sit, sit, do. Bloody hot, isn't it? Bloody deli, isn't it? You know, you have the utmost respect from our members. Most of your members? Most of our members. We do have the odd faulty firework. How are your lessons with Mr. Nepal going? He means Mr. Nepal. We used to call him Mr. Five Rackets an Hour. Angry, angry man. How many does he get through now? Oh, calm down a lot, has he? Well, that must be your calm, collected approach. Patience is everything. 
but my uncle's was beginning to fray. His place was on court. He had no time for this bumbling British banter. <clears throat> and then there's the Patels. How many of them do you teach? Five. Mr. Patel was a monolith in the architecture industry. Uh, helped build this place. He helped build this place, you know. Higher law, get on with it. Do they still have that horrible little boy, you know, the youngest? No, 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 they chopped him up for Briani. Of course they still have him. You know, the one that spits on court. Not anymore, he doesn't. You're probably wondering why I've called you in. By this point, he kind of knew. I'm afraid we're going to have to let you go. Let you go. Another British idiom. Like my uncle was some insignificant fish not good enough for the captain's table. Things have changed so much in recent months. The partition has caused major disruption, as I'm sure you know. Major disruption? Over two million dead. 20 million displaced. But uh, you go ahead and describe it like some irksome roadworks. The division is not just physical. It's religious and philosophical. There is anger on both sides of the camp. Uh, violence from both the Hindus and the Muslims. God, why can't you all just convert to Christianity? You already tried that, remember? Some of our Hindu members, our more prestigious members, carry with them these ridiculous prejudices, and there have been requests to, how do you say, put our house in order. No, that's how you say it. We say, apne aapko muntazir karo. So you understand our predicament. The officer was right about one thing. Partition had torn our lives apart. The start of the empire was definitely a case of divide and conquer. The end of the empire was much more divide than get the hell out before we get any more blood on our shoes. But who wanted my uncle gone? Who had made this request? Uh, Mr. Nippon? Mr. Nepal? No, no. Of course not. As you say, he has benefited greatly from your guidance. Then what of the Patels? You know, these people, when they get into positions of power, they believe they've been bloody well ordained by God himself. Yes, I know these people. Look, Naz. Oh, it's, it's Naz now. My hands are bound. Orders from the management. I thought it was the members. We will give you a, a five-star reference, though. Years of service for a piece of paper. We wish you all the best for the future. I knew my life would be in danger if I stayed where I was, so I had to abandon everything. I ran. I ran straight to the station with just the clothes I had on my back. The quickest way to Pakistan would normally be northwest through the Punjab. That's a journey of about half a day. But that route, well, it really was not safe. I had heard horrible stories, really awful. So, I headed south and took a train to Bombay. By that point, people from different religions had really started to show hatred to each other. It seems strange now, but I tried to disguise the fact that I was a Muslim. At one time, I wore an English hat and claimed to be Christian. At the port of Bombay, I found a passenger ship bound for Karachi. I was down to my last rupee, and it was not nearly enough to buy a ticket. So, with the money I had, I bribed the man at the dock gates and slipped on board. With no ticket, I was forced to hide from the ship's crew. With no money, I was starving. In the end, I was able to tell some fellow passengers what condition I was in. Thanks to their kindness, I was able to eat. Finally, I arrived in Karachi and stood on Pakistani soil for the first time. Pakistan a country that hadn't existed just a few months ago.
and it was several difficult years before I made my journey to England, where this letter, this letter, I am writing to introduce you to Nasrullah Khan. He has been a coach at Delhi Tennis and Squash Club for over 10 years. I am Maria Torpakai Wazir. I live on the Pakistan-Afghan border. Due to the increasingly hostile situation in this region, we have had to let him go. In this war-ravaged and mountainous area, my people reside without any ray of hope. For the time being, there are no further opportunities for him here. Young girls are passing their lives in such miserable conditions. No facilities in education, health, no recreational activities. He needs your help. I need your help. As long as he remains in India, his life is in danger. I have no hesitation in recommending him as a first-class squash coach. As long as I play squash, they'll come after me. As long as I live in Pakistan, they'll find me. Unlikely as it might seem, this letter helped me become who I am today. All right, you lot, let's get to it. Let's go. The best sportsmen and women in the world all have one thing in common. None of them got anywhere without hard work. Plain and simple. No one has ever succeeded on talent alone. Come on, keep going, keep going. And change. When I was 16, I spent the day training with one of the great British champions of the 1970s, Jonah Barrington. I remember it vividly. He was nearly 60 at the time, and I'll never forget how much time and effort he put into just warming up. Lunges, squats, split squats, ghosting, stretching, all this before even picking up a ball. Keep going, keep going. Come on, guys, keep pushing, keep pushing. You're doing so well. And we're changing. Through his actions, he taught me a most valuable lesson, that if you want to be great, incredibly good, or even just plain good, then commitment, practice, and constant repetition simply cannot be avoided. Come on, keep going, keep going. Come on, it's just like rehearsing, only different. Come on, do it again, only better. Come on, yeah. come on. I think at this point, my character would have a little lie down. Actually, mine too. Yeah, same. What? Actors, lightweight. All right, kids, you've whooped them. Can have a rest now. People talk about goats. Not those goats. G-O-A-T's, greatest of all timers. And Jonah was right up there with the very best of them. But his success didn't come out of nowhere. He had also a world-class coach, Nasrullah Khan. That letter that came with Naz on that life-threatening journey helped Jonah and eventually arrived at the Lansdowne Club in London, where he became a coach. Coaches, family, teachers, teachers heroes. heroes. Just four years after Nasrullah's journey to the UK, his cousin Hashim was returning to a hero's welcome back home in Pakistan. It's Hashim Khan. I'm a really big winner. Bow down to my majesty. I can hit the ball really, really far. Uh, what are you doing? I'm Hashim Khan, big hero. Yeah, hero as in chief male character of a book, play or film? Actor as in a person that plays a character that's not themselves. All right, well look, if you're going to do it, at least do it properly. All right, all right, what's your learn in it? All right, in you come children, in you come. Calm down, walk, and Ryan, tuck your shirt in. Elam, tie up your shoes. And, oh, Zala. 
You left your desk in a complete state before lunch. Remember, a tidy desk makes for a tidy mind. <laughs> That's different. I have a system. Who's that, miss? Uh, mind your P's and Q's. It's rude to point, Ryan. Who's that, miss? <laughs> All will be revealed in good time. Now settle down, settle down. Today we have a very special guest visiting us. None other than Hashim Khan. <laughs> this is Pakistan's first ever world champion. Squash, of course. What's squash? Uh, manners, everyone. I am so sorry, Mr. Khan. I'm not sure what's got into them today. Oh, that's not a problem. Energy is beauty, after all. Well, hello, children. Hello. I have just returned from England, where I won the British Open Squash Championships, the biggest tournament in the world. When my airplane touched down in Karachi, I was whisked off to a banquet in my honor, where I was presented with this gold watch that's been specially engraved. Oh. Next, I was floored off to be showered when even grander reception awaited me, driving an open top car. Thousands of people lined the way, cheering and smiling, with no idea what squash was, huh? <laughs> but. It is here in my village of Nawakile that the reception feels the warmest. Here, I am amongst family and friends. Being a baton means that my success is shared because part of our individual achievement is the source from which they come. Family, friends, tribe. Very much like this class. <laughs> More like warring factions most of the time. Oh, there's nothing wrong with your healthy rivalry. Eh? I do, and I bought it with me to show you. Oh. <laughs> Ryan! <laughs> Indeed, but we can't all have Mr. Khan's trophy. <laughs> but we can still all celebrate his success because we have a very special surprise for you all. <laughs> the headmaster wants you to join in the celebration, so he's decided to give you the day off. Yeah! Okay, calm down, calm down, Ryan. Tie up your shoelaces, please. Elam, pick up your feet. Oh, I always played squash barefoot until I went to England. Then they all laughed at me because the shoes I bought were too big. Huh? But I still beat them. Then they stopped laughing. Sometimes those who come to mock often stay to applaud. Fair enough. You were actually really good in that oh, bit. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I've never played the guy before. It's all oh. new to me. You spent a lot of time working on it. Yeah, whole two minutes back there. Nice, nice, nice. Uh, Do you mind if I... Well, I want you to start my little... Harsham's success set the benchmark for the rest of us. My own father, Roshan, went on to... <gasps> ah! Why did you even ask me? What is it with you men? <clears throat> Sometimes I think this is the only language you understand. Are we still acting here? What do you think? It kind of feels a bit real. Uh, ah. oh. I am Maria Thorpe-Kai Vizier. Ah. Ah. And I am not prepared to be invisible any longer. Okay, 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 I submit. Huh. And go take my things off. <sighs> Playing games. Something we should all have the right to do from a really early age. Games are how we socialize, how we learn to win, how we learn to lose. This is me. I was born in Waziristan on the borders of Pakistan and Afghanistan. Go ask if you can play over there. Forget about them, ask here. When I was growing up, I soon came to realize it wasn't just games that were off limits to me. Being a girl meant that I couldn't do any of the things I wanted to do. And if I tried, men and boys were often violent to me. No! Shoo! Shoo! One day, without even thinking, I made all that change. Go and get my dresses. I took all of my dresses, piled them up in the yard, and set fire to them. <sighs> 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 
Then I took a knife and cut off my long hair. Were you cold, child? No, Dad. Then you must be doing an experiment about combustion. Uh, carbon plus fire plus oxygen equals carbon dioxide. And? Well, I don't know, Baba. I'm just a child. And this is not an experiment. Well, if you're not warming your bones or feeding your mind, then what is the meaning of all of this? And what have you done to your beautiful long hair? Oh, I cut it. You could have gone to the hairdresser. I wanted my own style. You've made a mess. I like it. I can see that. This is how I want my hair from now on. And your dresses? You're going to walk around wearing ash? I want to wear my sports clothes. All the time? All the time. And what else do you want, my little Gulgati? Now, this is where it really could have gone wrong. You see, a lot of the men in my area believe that women should know their place. But my father was different. He brought his family up. My brothers and sister equal. I want to be a boy. <laughs> Don't make fun of me, Baba. No, 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 no. I wouldn't dare. No. You might be my daughter. You might be family. But above all, you are part of the tribe. You are a warrior. From this moment on, I will call you Genghis Khan. Gods and Jahangir are being a bit cruel here. In sight of victory and having it snatched away. When I was a child, if I wasn't playing squash, I was watching VHS tapes of all the old tournaments. Yep, that's what it was like back then. No on demand, no 24 hour kids channels. Well, that's my excuse anyway. During the school holidays, I would regularly surface at the crack of dawn just to watch footage of all the greats. Jahangir and Jan Shikhan, New Zealand's Susan DeVoy, Canada's Jonathan Power. I dreamed about walking onto those big tournament stages, lifting those same prestigious trophies. No matter who you are or where you live, when you're a kid, those idols on that stage, on that screen, they speak to you, they tell you, they reach out. You're the one, you're the one. You, you can do this. Sometimes my dad would bring home half a dozen VHS tapes in a brown paper bag, TV shows and films all the way from America with a new breed of hero. One of those films I would watch over and over again. That is if my brother Tamar would let me. <sighs> it's my turn to watch something. Uh, I am watching this. You always get to choose what film to watch. That's because I am the oldest. Because you're the boy. All right, what do you want to watch, Genghis? A classic story of a underdog fighting for his pride and dignity in a city that's so mean, it will chew you up and spit you out. So it's set in Peshawar then? Ha ha, Philadelphia. Uh, Philip, what? It's called Rocky and it's about a boxer. Ah, uh, that makes sense. And his opponent, his enemy, his nemesis is Apollo Creed. Like every boy in Peshawar, mean and stupid. You've nearly beaten up every boy in Peshawar. Yeah, and when I'm done here, I'm going to get to the next bus, go to the next town and challenge the toughest boy out there to fight and I'll beat him too. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, introducing tonight's challenger in the red corner from Waziristan, Genghis Khan. And in the blue corner, every last mean 
and dumb boy in Peshawar. The officials are ready. The fighters are ready. Boxing fans, are you ready? Let's get ready to rumble! Most boys will bark than bite. I beat these down to the ground easy. Some were tougher. We'd fight until we were exhausted. Ah! Breathless. Then we'd walk away. These were the unspoken jaws. More often than not, there was honor in these bouts. But there's always one dirty fighter. The brick split the skin from the crown of my head to the top of my neck. My father took me to the hospital and they stitched me up as best they could. Maria, do you remember what Rocky said about what you're doing? He said a lot of things, Baba. A lot of things about trying to win. It's not about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. I got hit hard. Maybe it's time to move forward. I don't understand. We need to find you a new game to play. There was only ever one game for me. Growing up, was squash was more a part of my life than climbing trees and bruised knees. It meant everything. So losing a squash match was the end of the world. There'd be tears, shouting, broken rackets. My dad was a coach. He was one of the best in the world. He was never pushy in terms of achievement, but he was very set. But if you're going to play squash, the one thing you do is you try hard, and you behave well. <laughs> and if I got that wrong, there'd be trouble. He taught me that. I think it's the greatest lesson I ever learned. My dad took me and my brother to the city sports complex, general in weightlifting classes. <sighs> weightlifting classes? He said, we need to find a new game, but this isn't what I had in mind. Then I overheard the words, boy, 12 years old, fist fights. Then I felt a swell of pride when I heard strong, brave. So, you're a pretty tough kid. The toughest. And you want to lift weights? Sure, why not? What's your name, boy? Genghis Khan. <laughs> the great Khan. Six months later, I was competing in the under-16 championships in Lahore. I'd never been so far from home before. And just me and my brother. And I had to sleep in a room full of boys for three days. Shh. I found a spot for you next to me in the corner. Wait, I can't do this. What if they find out? Shh. Just do as I say and you'll be fine. I still remember what my brother told me on the way to the tournament. 
If they ever find out, they'll hunt you down. Believe me, they'll hunt you down and they will kill you. On the first morning of the tournament, a terrible realization came over me. There's no way they won't find out now. Don't do it. Genghis, Taimor, Tupakai. Tupakai, Tupakai. Ah, yes. Well, remove your clothes. No, sir, I cannot. What did you say? I cannot. I cannot either. Oh, I see. You're ashamed. I understand. Ah, yes, we are ashamed. Yes, yes, deeply, deeply ashamed. Burning with shame. Uh, and humble. But don't forget humble. And modest. Or too far now. All right, step onto the scales and you can keep your clothes. I only went and won. The youngest, the underdog, competing after barely eight weeks. A 12-year-old girl against 15-year-old boys. Weightlifting wasn't challenging me. I had to find another sport. So I decided to venture further into the complex. What I found changed my life again. It was poetry in motion. A nuclear pinball. A boxing ring with no neutral corners. A lightning bolt of energy. It was serves and volleys, drops and lobs, nicks and boasts, lets and strokes. Love all, one love. I was hooked. Enro enrolling in squash wasn't as easy as weightlifting. This time, when my father spoke to the official, it was in hushed tones. No talk of strong or brave, and certainly no talk of boys. Up until this point, I lived my life as Genghis, but that wasn't the name of my birth certificate. Do you let girls play? Girls? Yes, my daughter here would like to know. So, you're a girl? Yes, I am Maria Torfakai Vizier, and I am not prepared to be invisible any longer. Well, Maria Torfakai, you're more than welcome. And <laughs> apart from a few silly boys I practiced with, I was. Pretty soon, I was making a name for myself as a squash player. That's right, I was paid and everything. I'd finally found my place in between four walls that set me free rather than locked me in. Maria Turpakai, squash champion. All right, if I carry on with my story now. Be my guest? Oh, but I'm not done yet. Squash is tough. My father Roshan got his teeth knocked out by his cousin Azam in the 1957 British Open final. Still won though. My father and his cousins won every British Open for over 10 years. By the 70s, it was my generation's turn. My older brother Torsum was starting to make a name for himself, and after my hernia operation, I was able to play. By the time I was 15, I won the World Amateur Championship in Melbourne. After that, Torsum had decided he would never become world number one, and instead would devote himself to coaching me. But first, he would play one last tournament. At the Australian Open, Thorsten found himself locked in a battle royale with New Zealander Nevin Barber. Both players bumped and jostled and fought 
Thorson was hit hard on the jaw by Baba's racket early on and had to rest for a minute or two. He was okay. He was okay at that point. He was okay. When play resumed, the struggle intensified. It was fierce, uncompromising squash, played at high speed and with bruising commitment. But the players had reached six all, when there was a collision, Thorsum collapsed. It wasn't a fall, he sort of sat down. His racket dropped out of his hand. Thorsum was laying on his side, his eyes closed, his body limp. My brother lapsed into unconsciousness. This time, beyond reach. My success came at a cost. By the time I was 16, I was traveling and playing nationally, internationally. But word of a Wazidi girl playing squash without a veil in shorts, reached the Taliban. I was thinking, what happened? What changed? You call me Maria. You call me Genghis. I'm still me. But no, if I walked outside, I was attacked. So I had to stay inside for my safety, for the safety of my family. If human bodies had, best, had a best before date, then mine would have expired several times over by now. I've not had any broken bones, no terrible falls, nothing major whatsoever, but nearly 10 years ago, I was told that I would never play again. It's hardly news to hold the front page, is it? The words first world problem come to mind, but it was my life, my reality. The cartilage in my hip was so thin, it was like an old man's. I couldn't leave my room after my brother died. Days and nights came and went with nothing but darkness to tell the difference between the two. Weeks turned into months. I was paralyzed by grief. There didn't seem any point in carrying on. One thing the Taliban hate as much as girls playing sports is artists, people with imagination. So, for three long years, I was stuck in my room, playing against the bedroom wall. And the only thing that kept me happy was visualizing myself on a squash court. And thinking I was on a podium and winning. <laughs> and if the neighbors complained, I just switched walls. My living, my livelihood literally depends how well I run around a glass box hitting little black balls about. I needed injections just to be able to play. After the Commonwealth Games in Glasgow, I had an operation and I stopped playing altogether. What was I gonna do now? It was so hard, but I found comfort in the words of my family and the words of the Quran. After so long, I was sick of being stuck in my room. So I decided to write emails, seeking help from people all over the world. To be, or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is simpler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing, end them. To die, to sleep no more. Dorsum! <laughs> And by a sleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks this flesh is heir to. Sometimes my brother would come to me in a dream, telling me to carry on. It is a consummation devoutly to be wished, to dream, to sleep, a chance to dream. I need your help. As long as I play squash, they'll come after me. As long as I live in Pakistan, they'll find me. Mm -hmm.
Hello, Maria. Thank you for your heartfelt email. I have discussed this with my club and we have raised funds for your ticket. Pakistan has a great heritage in squash and we would be happy for somebody with an outstanding talent such as yours to train with us. Best wishes, Jonathan Power. I don't remember what exactly it was that made me carry on or when I picked up a racket again. But it happened. And that's when I decided I would make history. It was Torsum's dream for me to become world champion, and it was my mission to make that dream a reality. And what got me through, apart from my family, was theatre. I've always loved it, but when my squash career took off, I never really got a chance to do it. So, I joined a local theatre group, and you know what? Turns out, squash and theatre have quite a lot in common. So nowadays, I don't really care if I win or lose, as long as I put in a good performance. So, how did I do? I've got a few notes to give. <sighs> this is Maria. She settled in Toronto, where she set up a foundation to help girls and women all around the world using sport to promote health, equality, and education. This is John Geard. A few years after his record-breaking and beaten run, he retired. But he continues to promote the game, as well as supporting charities that provide education and healthcare in Pakistan. This is James. He might be at the end of his playing career, but with his talents in performing and coaching, who knows what the next 20 years will lead to. In 2042, I became a teacher teaching ICT. In 2042, I started a movie called Squash, and I started an actor job as well. In 2042, I won the Turner Prize for my artwork. In 2042, I won a gold medal um, by running 800 meters in the Commonwealth Games. In 2042, I started a movie called Penalty. In 2042, I made a business that fixing cars that are broken. In 2042, I will become a surgeon. In 2042, I will be selling my biggest artwork ever, two million pounds. In 2042, I created a cure for chicken pox. In 2042, I was a lawyer and traveled to Saudi Arabia in Mecca. In 2042, I became an art teacher in a primary school. In 2042, I discovered a fossil that was a once in a lifetime discovery. In 2042, I sold one of my artwork for 300 million pounds. In 2042, I designed a game for PC. In 2042, I will be a doctor and save many people's lives. In 2042, I went to space and discovered a mystery planet. In 2042, I became the best prime minister. In 2042, I got a job as a plastic surgeon. In 2042, I became a police officer and I stopped a bank robbery. In 2042, I won a gold boot in the Champions League. In 2042, I am going to win loads of baseball games. In 2042, I wrote and illustrated my own book. In 2042, I became the president of Palestine. 